Good evening. Come on in. Let's take our song books out. Page number 50 in your song books. Page 5, 0, good marks and good years. that's in that blood is linked to the fact that we never are ever are going to have to answer for our sins. The fact that that, that blood gives us power to overcome every single uh, pain and hardship that we'll ever face in life. The, the power that we find in that blood lets us know that no matter how difficult things may get, we can understand that we can always overcome them because just like Jesus overcame death, we can overcome our difficulties Amen. and struggles. And uh, there is great power. And because of that power, we have great joy in him. And I want to go ahead and start with a word of prayer. And then we'll get started with the service. Heavenly Father, I love you. I thank you now for your goodness to us. And Lord, I'm praying that as we gather tonight, may this not be a service where we come in, we sit, we stay, we soak and sour. But Lord, I pray that you would allow us to be spirit-filled listeners. I pray that we would be spirit-filled singers. I pray that we'd be spirit-filled saints as we uh, hear the word of God preached and, and we would take it and then uh, use that in our day-to-day -day lives. We thank you for already everything that you've done. You've given us a wonderful Wednesday as we are able to uh, be a part of uh, 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 a beautiful, beautiful day as the sun was shining. It was still a uh, nice wintry day here in California, and yet uh, we're able to come to church and enjoy being in a, a warm uh, auditorium tonight. We pray that you would continue to bless in all that we do and be glorified in it in your holy name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Brother Mark's going to come lead us in our second song. Let's take our song books again, please, church. One. 14, 114, tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus, 114, we'll sing it out together on that verse, are you weary, are you heavy hearted, tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus, are you grieving, oh it was departed, tell it to Jesus alone, tell it to Jesus. 
and tell it to Jesus. That's a that's something that we all need to be accustomed to doing and going to God with our problems, going to God with uh, even not simply our problems. I think too often we are fast to go to God with our problems and very slow to go go to God when we're blessed. Mm. Uh, what do they say? More people uh, fall off the mountaintop than get stuck in the valley. And uh, I believe as Christians, we need to, and when we get to that mountaintop where God is blessing and it seems like everything is going well, uh, work is going great, family's doing great, there's money in the bank, there's food in the fridge, uh, your health is uh, A1, I think at that moment, we need to be thanking God Come regularly yes, because that is the exponential blessing of God. Mm -hmm. And recognize that, that those times are rare in life where things are just going great. And so uh, let's make sure we recognize that and tell it to Jesus on, on, on everything like that. If you have your prayer page here tonight, does anyone need one? Go ahead and raise your hand. We'll get one to you. And it looks like we got it taken care of there. Thank you so much. Let's take a look at the prayer page. And I want to start with number 14, soul winning. And uh, the goal for the church, the goal for the church is that we can be a lighthouse in our area. How do we do that? Well, what for, we've done for 20 years is we've gone door knocking and we've told people, this is where we're at. This is what we do. This is uh, uh, this is the, the gospel here. And uh, uh, just even this, this past week, I, we were out door knocking. I went out with uh, 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 Evie and Liam and uh, we got to a door and a lady goes, oh, I know you. You were, you, you kind of bounced around a few, a little bit. And I went, well, what do you mean? And I, I really didn't know what she was meaning. She goes, I, you, were, you were at that, that old church there in, in Union City. And I said, oh yeah, Brown Temple. And she was like, oh, yeah, I remember that. And then I, I, a friend of mine visited you guys when you were in the Ir Irvington area. And I said, oh, okay, yeah, we were there uh, a few years back. And she goes, uh, where are you now? And I said, well, I, I guess I need to give you the update. We're, we're, we're right here on mission. And she goes, oh, okay, I think I know where that is. Is that the Fremont Community Church? I said, no, 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 no. We're actually a little further down. And I explained that to her. And she goes, oh, wow. She goes, I, I, I've, I've seen your church uh, uh, all over the place here. And uh, uh, she says, we, we go to a, a Baptist church in Hayward. However, uh, we have seen, we've, we've seen your, your church and everything. And we've thought about visiting. And I said, well, I hope you would. And the doors are always open. And so, uh, uh, but the goal for a church, the goal for a Christian, tell people about Jesus. Hey. And uh, what better way to do that than with the church on a Saturday morning? Uh, we provide donuts. We provide coffee. Uh, we'll give you tracks. We'll give you a map. And hopefully we'll be able to pair you up with someone. If not, get you get you going on your way. And you say, well, I'm not comfortable at a door. Then we just take your tracks and just... Take your track and just put it in the door and then go to the next door and put it in your door. If you run into someone, here's all you got to do. Hey, I've, I've got an invitation from uh, Victory Baptist Church. That's it. That's all you have to do. Have a nice day. And what you're doing is you are doing your part in informing people about the gospel. And so uh, I hope you'll be a part of that. That's this Saturday at 10 a.m. And uh, let's not miss that. And then we have number... Uh, uh, 21, uh, that's a praise as uh, uh, we found out that the church insurance will take care of the majority of, of that uh, for us. And so we, we should be getting that fixed here relatively soon. I have to work with the uh, Mission Valley Church to get that going as soon as possible. And so let's continue to be in prayer for them. Number 22, Ms. Necka Cry, as she is expecting. Let's uh, be in prayer for her. Number uh, 24, Brother Winfredo uh, Mendoza, praying for his health. And uh, uh, number 26, Miss Bonnie Goodman. And I love, I get texts from Miss Bonnie uh, uh, throughout the week, and she lets me know how she's doing and uh, continue to be in prayer for her. Let's, let's be in prayer. I, I, I think it'd be such a great success if uh, uh, we've, we, unfortunately, we had COVID pass through the church during, uh, in between Christmas or Thanksgiving and Christmas. Wouldn't it be an amazing success that the amount of people that got it and we all ended up on the right side of our health? That would be, that would be tremendous. 
And so let, let's be in prayer for that. And uh, I'm, I'm daily praying for Miss Bonnie on that. Number 32, unsafe family and friends. Number 40, uh, pray for our president and family. I've I seen this. And I, I, there's, there's some funny to it um, where we, we talk about, uh, you know, Biden's losing his mind and all this stuff. And it, it's funny. It's funny to crack jokes. But let's, let's not forget that as much as you may like or dislike your president, um, he's on your team. You don't want to hurt someone on your team because you hurt someone on your team, you hurt your team. And uh, and so uh, as much as as much as uh, that goes around, let's be careful not to not to uh, make it more difficult for someone to do their job because when they do their job right, uh, it, it works best for us. And so keep that thought in mind. Number uh, 51, uh, Miss Eddie Carey. This is a request from Miss Christy Innocencio. She she uh, uh, told me about uh, her. This is one of her best friends. Uh, they live in North Carolina area, and uh, um, uh, she was doing well until just a couple days ago that uh, her health began to plummet, and they were worried if she was even going to make it. And so if you could, let's continue to be in prayer uh, for number 51. Number 57, Grace Dana. This was a request from uh, uh, Brother Rosalo here as uh, she has cancer. Number 58, Lloyd Arroyas. Uh, this is a friend of the Catalans. Uh, praying for her eye. Miss uh, 59 is Miss Edna Drogemeyer. Uh, sweet, sweet lady. She would she would come to our church several years back, and uh, she would come to our church, sweet lady. And uh, uh, she she since moved away, but let's be in prayer for her and her health um, on, uh, on this. And, um, then we have our missionary of the week, the board family serving in Cambodia. Our upcoming events, the next one, next big event that we've got coming up is uh, the 30th Pack the Pew Sunday. And uh, my goal, my prayer is that our church people come back. Amen. That's, that's, that's really it. Uh, we, had, we had a few visitors on, uh, on baptism Sunday. That was, that was really great uh, to hear or to see rather. And uh, but my goal for Pack the Pew is that our church people come back. And uh, I think that would be a tremendous blessing. If you're if you're one waiting for the pandemic to end, or waiting for the variant to pass over, or whatever, understand it might not. So, so what what do you do now? Uh, we have to we have to uh, we have to walk a thin line of practicing faith and being careful. And uh, we we we. That's just where we're at right now. Um, the early church had to do that with persecution. We, we have to do that with pestilence. Every, every generation has their own struggles to why, why it's hard for them to keep their faith. Um, we don't have a lot of the pressures that other generations do, but we have this. And so let's be faithful in that. Number, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, our college student of the week is Ms. Fran Munoz. And uh, our, we, you see all the unspokens and everything that are listed there. I've got two more requests here. Uh, Nova uh, Ventosia, the Nova Ventosia family, uh, uh, praying for peace and comfort as the uh, father passed away here. And uh, so this is a request from the Mendozas. Let's be in prayer uh, for the Ventosia family. It's V-E-N-T-O-C-I-L-L-A family. And then uh, uh, number next here, Ramil. Nova and Meg, uh, as they travel uh, for travel mercies, as they leave the uh, going to go back to the Philippines from um, uh, I believe Hawaii, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, or from here they're from here they're going going there, and uh, that's going to be uh, on the 26th. So let's be in prayer for them, and I believe we've got we've got Mendoza family on here, uh, number 54. That I think these are the names that go with that, and I'll be able to change that. Uh, on there, but uh, that's Ramil, Nova, and Meg. Let's be in prayer for them. Any prayer requests or praise we can add to this sheet? Uh, yes, uh, yes, sir, Brother Dennis. Pray for my landlord's mother. I don't know her name. She's 92 years old and now has COVID. Mm. Hmm. Let's uh, pray for uh, Brother Dennis's landlord's mother here. 
And uh, who, uh, uh, Miss Adriana? Pray for Cynthia Goodman and pray for her health. And then uh, um, also let's, uh, if we can, be if you maybe you have her number or, or whatnot, uh, you can text her a happy birthday, Miss Christy Ojigo. Uh, her birthday is today. Uh, yesterday was my mom's, and, uh, and so let's, if we can, let's remember them. Uh, as we uh, uh, move forward through our day. Happy birthday, Mrs. Ojigo, I know you're watching, and so happy birthday to you. And any others, any other prayer requests? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, praise, Pastor. Uh, it was very good to see Baptism Sunday, and uh, as a father, got to see my son, uh, my oldest, uh, get baptized. And uh, just thank you to all of you who, um, you encourage Nico, and uh, especially, Tolerate him. I think that's more of a <laughs> to use, but that, that just thank you to have a great church family that encourages the youth and gets them closer to God. So, Amen. so I thank you. Uh, thank you for that. That's awesome. I, I I enjoyed baptism Sunday. That was that was very sweet. And those kids will remember it because that water was freezing. Yep. <laughs> uh, we tried. We tried as much, and then I left the water. I forgot to drain it. I came in here. Uh, that's where you kind of hear the gurgling back here. Uh, we. Pull the plug, but I walked in here tonight and I said, oh, I wonder. And I touched the water, it was warm. Oh. That water was perfect. No. So uh, <laughs> now I know. Now I know. Uh, yes, Miss Adriana? Um, I also have a phrase that I got better because while I was out of the hospital, I was able to get sick, most likely COVID. Amen. Praise God. Any others before we wrap it up? Yes, Ms. Mendoza. Good. Amen. All right. Any others? Yes, sir, Sean. Yeah, I have a co-worker um, named Joseph Vander, and he's in his mid-70s. He's been to work in a few weeks. and gave him a call the other day. He sounded horrible. I think he's fighting a pretty nasty science infection. And it's been, it's been weighing heavy on me, so uh, I'd like to pray for him. All right, let's pray for Joseph Zander here, um, co-worker of Brother Sean. Pray for his health. It was so good. Uh, Miss Meredith was. She came into the, uh, the church today, and uh, you probably noticed it smells good. It's super clean here. Uh, uh, Miss Meredith came in, and she does a, a, a tremendous job. It's been been a while her, with her health, but she got back to it. She did a tremendous job, and uh, I'm always so uh, encouraged when she comes. I, I normally leave while she's cleaning to go pick up the kids, and then when I come back and I open the door, I like. Oh, it smells so good, and, and everything's just put put nicely. And she does little projects around the church. I believe she did a bookshelf for the nursery in there, and and little things here and there. Uh, I tell you what, there's a lot of people behind the scenes that you have no idea uh, the amount of work that they put in so that things run well at the church. And uh, I thank God for that, definitely. I'm gonna have Brother Mark come and lead us on our last song. Join me in standing, please, church, 258, 258. Oh, how I love Jesus, 258 here. Let's sing it there all together.
Great to see you, church. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you so much for singing out. I love I love hearing when the church sings. It's, it's an exciting exciting thing for me. It encourages me. Um, the uh, I, I was at a funeral yesterday for uh, um, our kids' school secretary, and most school secretaries are almost invisible. <laughs> um, but uh, this this lady, she was incredible, and uh, um, went there and they they had some singing at the church there, and I I, I just I stopped singing for a moment just to hear the voices as everyone was singing, and uh, it just does something to you Amen. just to hear the church sing. Um, I, I, I our church has always loved singing, and it's always been a part. It's been a, DNA, a part of our DNA to have singing. I, I, I attribute a lot of that all the way back to when Pastor Ford was here, and he he started our our music ministry and our choir and everything. And then uh, um, uh, we we really just made a push for it. Amen. I am driven by music. Music drives me in almost everything. I, I constantly have music playing. Music, I, I have music uh, at night. It's just always something going on. I, I love it. It, it. it moves my mind in, in ways and it keeps me focused. Um, I, if, if, I'm, if I'm working out, I have to have music playing just to keep my, my mind focused. And, and, and like today, I went, I went out for a jog. And as I'm jogging, I have to have music and I run to that beat. Run to that. And it, it keeps me going. Um, we should, as much as possible, uh, have music that moves us. Now, uh, um, when I say move us, music, there's all, several different types of music. Uh, as a pastor, I'm talking about Christian music. We ought to have Christian music that can move our spirit and get us to want to walk with him and want to have a relationship with him. And uh, I'd hope that we would uh, have that on a, in a steady diet of our, uh, for our ears there. If you have your Bible, let's go to Job chapter 22. And uh, um, we are, <laughs> I, I, Brother uh, Gian always comes in and he asks me, Pastor, uh, what's, the, uh, uh, what's the title of the message? And I, at the time, I was trying to staple my notes together. And I, I, I struggling to staple my notes. And I said, it's a bad sign when you can't staple your notes together. And he goes, well, it must be either a, a bad stapler. And I said, well, it's too many papers. Um, we're going to be looking at a few chapters here. Don't worry. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to go. Hey man, come on. Don't worry. <laughs> I don't want to uh, make a promise that I can't keep. Uh, but Job 22, uh, we are looking at the last time Job will speak with or have a conversation with Eliphaz and really all three of his friends here. And as he's speaking to Eliphaz, uh, or as Eliphaz is speaking to him, Eliphaz takes a different approach in this last time, this is it's more shortened than the last the last couple times that they've uh, spoke. Uh, it's more direct, and uh, uh, at this point, they're they're just getting personal. And uh, because a lot of it will be, as I mentioned before, a lot of it will be um, kind of seeming like the same old things that they're, they keep saying. I'm going to jump through a lot of stuff. That's why I can go through. We're going to look at chapter 22, 23, and 24 here. So uh, um, as, we, uh, as we do that, understand that we're not going to take the full long approach that I would normally do with a chapter. But uh, uh, he starts off here in chapter 22, Eliphaz, as he's speaking. He says in verse number two, Can a man be profitable unto God? as he that is wise may be profitable unto himself. Here, uh, Eliphaz has taken some time to listen to Job as Job has kind of tried to defend himself to his friends. Think about that for a moment, where you are struggling 
at the worst moment of your life. And the people that should be helping you are rather making things worse. Job is continuing to get uh, put on trial for why he's going through some of these hardships, to say the least. And Eliphaz starts off by saying, hey, can you be profitable to God like a wise man is profitable to himself? Now, in this, there is some theology that needs to be fixed. Because understand something, no matter what you do or who you are, God does not need you. I think it's very important to understand that. Uh, I, have, I have known several different pastors. I've known several different Christians, uh, people in the ministry that believe that they're God's choice servant. I would want God to say that about me. I would never want to think that of myself. I would be hesitant. I, I, I would feel really awkward if someone said that about me. Why? Because I know who I am. I know my weaknesses. I know my failures. I know uh, who, uh, how I think. I know what my flaws. And because of that, I would feel such like a fraud. We give no profit to God. God gives us profit. He makes us worth anything. What is that, that verse? Uh, uh, without me, he can do nothing. So Eliphaz is coming at this with a wrong theology, to say the least, which is interesting considering his religious background. But once again, he's, he's wondering why Job thinks he's so special to God. It's almost ironic, the fact that he would say that, uh, where he would say, oh, essentially, why do you think you're so special? In fact, we, we continue on in verse number three. He says, is it any pleasure to the Almighty that thou art righteous, or it is gain to him that thou makest thy ways perfect? Notice the wording he uses here. He says, is it any pleasure to the Almighty that thou art righteous? There's sarcasm in that. But do you remember chapter one? What was, what was some of the character uh, traits of Job? He was a man who was righteous. He, he sh uh, uh, shoot evil. He, he was upright. He was, as it said, perfect. Now we understand perfect doesn't mean sinless. He was mature. And yet we find the two words that God used to describe Job in Eliphaz's sarcasm. And, and so he continues on. Uh, if you go, to, go with me to verse number four, he, he says, will he reprove thee for fear of thee? Will he enter with thee in judgment? He, at this point, he doesn't believe that Job is a God-fearing man anymore. At this point, he is looking at Job as if he is, that, as if God fears Job. And he continues to describe his wickedness to Job, explaining who he is and, and what he is seeing out of Job. Uh, the reason why Job went through this 
trial was not because Job was wicked, was because God wanted to prove to Satan that Job would not fall. He says, uh, if we continue reading here in verse number uh, um, uh, verse number 10, he says, therefore, snares are round about thee, and sudden fear troubleth thee. He says, Job, you're, you are wicked, and you don't even see it, that your whole life is, is caught up in snares. Snares are a, a, a hunting tool. It's something that they would use to catch game, and, and it would either maim them or kill them in, along the way. And he says, your whole life is, is set up with snares because you are wicked. And then, then he says, um, verse number 11, or darkness that thou canst not see and abundance waters cover thee. Is not God the, the, the height of heaven? And behold, the height of the stars, how high are they? Here he's, he's taking what Job knows and saying, can you, can you tell me how big God is? Can you describe who he is? It's interesting, uh, as, as Eliphaz is asking that later on, we're going to find, as Job, when Job does talk to God, that he asks God how big he is. He begins to ask Job, um, he begins to ask Job, uh, uh, when is he going to stop? From, from being uh, down, going down this wrong way. Verse number 18, yet he filled their houses with good things, but the counsel of the wicked is far from me. The righteous see it and are glad in the innocent laugh them to scorn. Whereas our substance is not cut down and the remnant of, of them and the fire consume us. He's saying, look, we see it as the righteous. We see your wickedness. We see your errors. We see your faults. And he says, well, Job, what you need to do is you need to begin to confess your sins to God. Verse 20, 21, he says, acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. He says, go to God so that way you can be in peace. By the way, let me tell you something. If you are struggling with with internal fears, if you're struggling with internal uh, an internal battle about your decisions that you've made or different things like that, the best thing to do is go to God. Because if we go to God, He will grant peace. There's no wonder that at His birth, they, they said that He was the Prince of Peace. There's no wonder that uh, uh, Paul said when he was in his greatest trial that He will bring peace. In fact, even Jesus, right before he was going to the cross, Jesus says, my peace I give to you. You struggle with it when it seems like everything is weighing on you and you just can't, you can't hold on to it and, and you, you're just battling some of this stuff. Let me tell you something. Stop battling it by yourself and go to the one who can grant you some peace. And, and, and some of the, the, the things that Eliphaz says are so very right. And I've said that about all his friends. They're so right and yet so wrong. Look, continue what he says here. He says, verse 22, Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. He's telling them essentially... Go take that which is right to do and uphold the words that he says in your heart. Yeah, essentially, two things. We, we sang the song on Sunday. Trust and obey. Trust his words and obey them. Put it, put it in your heart and then live it in your life. A true Christian, that, those two things, if you don't have those two things, I, I tell you, number one, you're either backslidden. Number two, you're not saved. You trust God and you obey. 
one of those is gone, something's wrong with your life. He says this in verse number uh, 23. He says, if thou wilt return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. It says in verse 24, thou shalt lay up gold as dust and the gold of offer as the stones of the brooks. He, he, he's telling him that if he, if he just goes to God and, and confesses his sin, that God is going to prosper his way. Now, once again, this is improper philo uh, uh, theology. Just because you get right with God does not mean you are going to get rich by God. I don't care what, what any of these prosperity gospels, name it and claim it, blab it and grab it type preachers say. You're not going to get rich simply because you're close to God. And if that's, your, if that's your incentive to do what God says so you can get riches, let me tell you something. You are going to be struggling. You're going to be bitter at your Christian life. He says in verse 27, Thou shalt make thy prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. He, he, he's essentially telling him that if he gets right with God, that God's blessing, like, like a spotlight, will be on him. And that if he, if he asks anything of God, God will listen. Verse 29, he says, When men are cast down, then shalt thou say, There is lifting up, and he shall save the humble person. That, that little phrase there is a jab at Job because he's saying Job is arrogant, too arrogant to be saved from his plight in life. He's saying, if you were just to get right when other people who are humble in their trespasses, when they come, when they come to you, you you're, you're going to be able to lead them to the past where they that are actually going to help them. And he finishes out in verse 30. He says, he shall deliver the island of the innocent. And it is delivered by the pureness of thy hands. He's saying, you, you'll be able to do great things because then you'll be pure. It's amazing words that Eliphaz speaks towards the end. And, and for the most part, pretty dead on, just not for Job. If Eliphaz would have applied these words to his own life and found his own imperfect uh, relationship with God, maybe he would be a good counselor and a good encouragement to Job. But you know what Eliphaz's problem is? As this is the last time we will, we will visit with him. Eliphaz's problem is he likes to hear what he says, but he doesn't like to practice what he preaches. And the unfortunate thing is there's a lot of Christians that like to speak a lot of powerful, swelling words, but they don't like to live it in their Christian life. You want to see the results of that? Chapter 23. Then Job answered and said, Even to, uh, today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. You know what he says? I'm more depressed today than I've ever been in my life. I've never suffered through so much pain.
you can either bring life or take life. You say, well, what if I, I do neither? No, you either bring life or take life. Two types of people in the world, givers or takers. Takers are only concerned with themselves. They're only concerned about being right. They're only concerned about material possessions. They're only concerned about what makes them happy. They're only concerned about the, their, the, how they feel. Takers take life from people. Givers, givers are the type of people that no matter what the situation is, even when it is uncomfortable, they'll be more than pleased to give. Givers, oftentimes givers are doormats, unfortunately. Oftentimes, givers find themselves depressed. Why? Because people always take and they never seek to give back. Givers often find themselves depleted, empty, broken. And even in an empty, broken state, givers will still find a way to continue giving. But they'll do it bitter. Isn't that what? Verse 2, even today is my complaint bitter. Bitterness began to swell up in Job's heart because it seems like no matter what he does, no, no matter how bad things got for him, nobody wanted to give back to him. They just wanted to continue to take out of his life. So as we get to Job 23, Job begins to wish he could stand before God, as we see here in verse 3. He says, oh, that I, I knew where I might find him. He says, if I could just find God. Now, I find this interesting. I find it interesting for a couple of reasons. Number one, because Job is a, what we can call a good or devout Christian, uh, understanding that there were no Christians at this time, but he was devout to God. He would be considered a good Christian. But Job struggled to find God in his life. And, and by the way, it, it's not because he was sinning either. Look at verse number uh, uh, four. He says, I would order my cause before him. I would fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand that he would say unto me, will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. He says, if I could just, and very bold statement here, essentially, he says, if I could just put God on the on the uh, 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 the witness stand. If I could just question him, if I can just ask him and 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 stand before him and give plead my case, so that way you wouldn't think that my character is at fault. Because he says, I know I'm still righteous. I know I would I, I'd be able to stand there and 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 not say that I, I have been wicked. I know who I am. That's a bold statement, is it not? There are a lot of Christians that would not be able to say that with full confidence. To be able to say, I know I'm doing what's right. I know I'm living the right way. I know I'm doing the right thing. Most of the time when Christians can't find God, when Christians are struggling with, with, with pressure, when they're struggling with anxiety, when they're struggling with, when, it, when they're struggling with joy in their life, and it seems like everything is a, a work, it's usually because they're in sin. That's not the case here for Job. 
And that's why this is what we call advanced, an advanced Bible study, because this doesn't apply to most Christians. You see, Job, as a good Christian, couldn't find God because Job was focused on his problems. And he knew, even though he understood the situation, and he understood, he even said it in verse number six, he says, will he plead against me with his great power? No, he says, but he would put strength in me. He says, if I can, if I can get alone with God, I know he will put strength in me. But let me ask you, have we seen Job talk to God? He says, he continues and, and goes on, um, verse number 10. He says, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Uh, he's not being arrogant when he says that. We find this again in, in, in the book of James. As, as, as we're talking about going through trials, we shall come forth as gold. Uh, gold is always made better when it's put through the fire. But you see, gold has value, doesn't it? There are some people that have no value. Wait, hold on. Would you go chapter 22 again? Verse 2. Can a man be profitable unto God? Wait, he's saying he's going to come forth as gold. How? Is he saying he is profitable to God? No, what he's saying is, I know what he's put in me, and that grants me value. And as I go through this, these tr troubles in life, as I go through this, this, this time of, uh, of, of pain and sorrow, he says, I will come forth as gold, valuable, because of what he's done through me. He says in verse 11, my foot hath held his steps, his way have I kept and not declined. It, what was the goal again that God did for Job's life? He wanted to prove to Satan that Job would not curse his name essentially and leave him. go off and do what's wrong simply because things are going bad in his life. Job here says, my foot hath held his steps. I've stayed exactly where I need to be. He says, verse 12, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. He says, this is how important God is to me. Eliphaz, before you begin to, to, to try to break down who I am as a person and my character and my spiritual, uh, 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 my spiritual character, he says, before you begin to break that, I hold God's word more valuable than food. I love food. When I say I love food, I finish my food and I think about what am I going to eat later. I love food. I am not exaggerating. If I, if I didn't restrain myself, I would eat all day. Food is a necessary thing, isn't it? I think they say the 
human body can go up to 42 days without food. Although after 30, without uh, uh, proper protein, the body begins to break down. Food is necessary. But here he says, God's word supersedes that necessity for my life. When are we going to get to that level? When's your pastor going to get to that level? See, if we continue reading what he says here, he, he's, he says in verse 13, but he is in one mind, and who can turn him, and uh, what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. Uh, therefore I am, verse 15, he says, therefore I am troubled at his presence when I consider I am afraid of him, for God maketh my heart soft, and the Almighty troubleth me because I was not cut off before the darkness. Neither hath he covered the darkness from my face. He's saying, I, I love God. I, 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 he is the most important thing in my life. He says, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid to find out why I'm like this right now. If you go to verse 24, uh, chapter, chapter 24. As he finishes his reply here to Eliphaz, he says, Why seeing, the, uh, seeing times are not uh, hidden from the Almighty? Do they that know him see his days? Some remove the landmarks. They violently take away flocks and feed uh, thereof. They drive away the ass as uh, uh, of, of the fatherless. They take the widow's ox for a pledge. Here, he, he's seeing the, the conduct and, and the way that the wicked live their life. He, he, he begins to, he, he makes mention that they remove the landmarks. Uh, landmarks were a way that they would mark, uh, essentially mark the land. Simple as that. I've heard so many uh, people say, uh, uh, there's that verse, remove not the ancient landmark. Uh, the, they, they'd say, you remove that thing, you're removing uh, something that God put there. Now, uh, what they're really saying is, don't lose the boundaries of where we ought to be where God has placed us. He's saying, uh, he's saying that they move the boundaries. They're consistently trying to take further and further steps to get past and, and go further into the world and go further into things that don't belong to them. And they're consistently pushing that thing. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 19 talks about how this is a problem for the, the children of Israel. The children of Israel were consistently trying to push the boundaries of their landmarks so that way they were getting closer and closer to the, uh, 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 the Canaanite, uh, 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 the people of the Canaanite. And the closer they got to them, the more they began to take on their gods. I can go a whole message on the landmarks being moved and how we're getting closer and closer to the world in our Christian life. To the point where uh, later on we find that in the book of Timothy, he says that they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. You push those landmarks uh, far enough, you may be on the side of, uh, uh, of where Christianity is, but let me tell you something, you are far removed from where you should be. He says in verse number six, they reap everyone his corn in the field and they gather the, the, the 
vintage of the wicked. They cause the naked to lodge without clothing. They have no covering in the cold. He says, essentially, they're, they're people with no, no boundaries. They're people with no... Uh, that they, they have no coverings for themselves, meaning that they're allowing every, every bit of the world to affect them. Verse 9, they pluck the fatherless from the breast. They take pledge of, of the poor. They cause him to go naked without clothing. They take a, a, away the sheep from the hunger, uh, the hungry. Uh, here we, we're saying that more taking and more taking and more taking. And, and we all go through times of being takers. But if you are, if you're categorized as a taker, you need to break your heart. The life of a Christian is not a taker, but a giver. Husbands, if you find yourself being a taker, break your heart. Wives, if you find yourself consistently taking, break your heart. Young people, you may not have money, you may not have things and be depend you may be dependent on your family, but stop being a taker. Give, work, help, be a benefit. Well, I, I, I'll do my chores when I start getting paid. No, do your chores so that way you can help the house. Stop being a taker at work. Well, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna put any more effort in because uh, if I put more effort in, then they're just gonna expect that out of me. Good. Be better than the world. And here we have takers consistently taking, and he's saying this is what the wicked does. And then he says there's some security. For some reason that the wicked find security in their wickedness. He says in verse 13, they are of those that rebel against the light. They know not the ways thereof, nor abide in the pastor of the murdering, rising with the light, killeth the poor and the needy, and the night of, as, a, as a thief. The eye also of the adulterer waiteth uh, for the twilight, saying, No eye shall see me, and disguise his face. They, he's saying they get so caught up in what they're doing as wicked that they no longer feel like anyone cares. And he, he is saying that because Eliphaz was saying, you're wicked and you don't even care to change your life. And he says, I'm not wicked because I wish I could stand in front of God. Then he says this, uh, verse 18, he says, He is swift as the waters. Their portion is cursed in the earth. He beholdeth not the way of the vineyards. Drought and heat consume the snow waters. So doth the grave those which have sinned. He's saying, essentially what he's saying here, and he'll say that all the way down to verse number uh, 21. He says, the wicked deserve to be punished. He says they deserve the, 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 the way that God would, would treat them. But if we found, he rounds it out in verse number 24. He says they are exalted for a little while, but are gone and brought low. They are taken out of the way as all other. They cut off as the tops of the ears of corn. So if they be not so now, who will make me a liar and make my speech nothing worth? 
He finishes out that last part by saying, if all that's true, he says, I want to challenge, it poses a challenge to them. He says that the righteous may be greater sufferers and the wicked may for a while prosper, but that God will in the end overthrow the ungodly and establish the righteous. You know, rather than getting bitter, or rather, I should say, he wasn't bitter, but rather than allowing his bitterness to take over him to the point where he began to continue to defend himself, he looks at Eliphaz and says, let time show you if I'm wicked or righteous. He says, because at some point, God will judge. And he says, at that point, you'll be able to properly judge in my life. But until then, do not try to kill my character. The book of, or the, the pastoral epistles talk a lot about being blameless before God. Blameless does not mean to be perfect. Blameless essentially means that you, that anything that comes your way, you can stand without fault. It's like, a, it's like one of those Teflon pans. You get that egg. A egg is one of the hardest things to, to, to cook in a pan, isn't it? You crack that egg and you put that in there. And if you don't have one of those Teflon pans, let me tell you, you're going to have eggs stuck all over that pan. No matter how much oil you put in that thing, as soon as you go to fry that thing, it, you're going to have egg everywhere. But it's interesting. You get one of those really nice pans that are non-stick and they really are non-stick not like those fake non-sticks that you get at, and, and you, you use it once and that thing is just ruined mess uh, but you get one of those good ones you crack that egg in there it just begins to bubble on the bottom there and you just see it and then you go to take that spatula to flip it over uh, you sh there should be no no uh, 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 obstacles to flip that thing over why? Because nothing is sticking to it. You know what the Christian needs to be? Non-stick. Not perfect. You know, you're gonna get you're gonna get a little uh, white, the egg whites on the on the edges of the pan occasionally. You're gonna get burn marks here and there. But when you flip that egg over, it should be non-stick. As we go through life, we're going to get some things on us here and there. But Job, as he's standing before his friends, having his character in, called into question, he says, I know I can stand before God right now. And I know I'm standing righteous before him. Not perfect. But every accusation, non-stick. He says, you want, to, you want to know the proof? Once this egg gets out of the pan, you're going to see. Stay faithful. Keep your foot on the right path as trials come. And it'll be amazing later when other people see. In fact, uh, one thing I, I didn't make mention of it in chapter 42, we're going to find as Job goes to God in prayer for his friends. Isn't it funny? The one that should have been the encouragement is needing the encourage uh, or is needing the intercession prayers from Job. Givers and takers. Number one, are you a giver or are you a taker? 
Number two, how's your life? Are you able to stand up and say, I am righteous before God? And number three, stay faithful. Above everything, above everything here, the important aspect here for Job is that we're seeing his faithfulness in the midst of his lowest time. And uh, hopefully that was a help to you here tonight. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, I love you and I thank you for all that you've done. Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless this scripture, help it to be a uh, help to us. I pray that we each be able to apply different areas to our life. And uh, Lord, I, I pray that you would give us wisdom and discretion as we deal with others that are going through hardships. May we not be as Job's friends, but Lord, I pray that you would allow us to be givers of that which is good to those who are in need. We love you now and thank you for all that you've done in your holy name. Amen. Thank you so much for being in church here tonight. I look forward to seeing you Saturday for soul winning 10 a.m. and then Sunday for church. I love you. God bless.